Hello, everybody, and welcome to another webinar in our webinar series Inside XIF. My name is Susan Aschenbrenner, and today we are having a look in depth into one of, um, of very important applications, which is ferroalloys. Um, if there are any questions during this presentation, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A section of the Zoom. Um, if there will be enough time in the end of this uh, webinar, I will try to answer some of the questions um, um, in the ending of this webinar. If um, there's not enough time and we are somehow having a, re a really straight um, a program <laughs> um, today, um, I will still answer them later uh, via email. So ask plenty questions whenever something comes to your mind um, and just um, put your questions into the Q&A section and we will answer them later. So let's dive into it directly. What are ferroalloys? If you Google ferroalloys and uh, you, you hit Wikipedia, you get a list of, um, of common ferroalloys. And I thought maybe it's a nice thing to just have a look first, like what is the thing that we are talking um, about today? Like how, how broad is our topic? And you can see from this list that our topic is really, really broad. Um, you can see the um, ferroalloys that are marked in yellow. Those are the ferroalloys that we are working with like most of the times. So um, when we are in, uh, in Fluxana, we are working with ferroalloys, then we are working with uh, ferrochromium, ferromanganese and so on, all these yellow ferroalloys. You can see there are some more um, for those for some of them, we still have some um, some kind of experience um, with dealing with these ferroalloys. For some, we don't. So, if you are having any questions concerning um, concerning the ferroalloys that are not marked in yellow, we will still be happy um, to help you with this. But this will need some um, some more um, yeah s s some more um, experience that we need to um, have there and for the yellow ones we are we are quite happy that we are having a lot of experience with dealing with these ferroalloys when it comes to measurement um, on an XIF device okay and now we can directly go to the preparation of these ferroalloys and I first want to talk about fusion, because you hear a lot of times ferroalloys, fusion, hmm, that's so tough, that's not possible. And I just want to, um, want to have a closer look onto what is possible and what is not. Um, which kind of fusion machines are normally used in laboratories? Um, you can use um, a manual muffle furnace. So you yourself, you are standing in front of a muffle furnace and you are doing all the um, putting the crucible into the furnace, getting it out, mixing, pouring. This is all done manually in this case. If you don't want to do it manually, there are automatic muffle furnaces like um, our Vitriox electric devices. Um, there are devices that are um, handling one um, sample at a time, and there are devices that are handling more um, than one uh, sample at a time, depending um, on, on what you need. Then there's induction furnaces. Um, we don't um, offer these uh, kinds of um, fusion machines, but um, they are still in the market and they are used. And then there are gas fusion machines that are running on propane, butane or natural gas. And these look like, like these Vitriox gas, very, very common method, very traditional method to do it. So let's first of all, have a look um, onto what is happening when we are talking about oxidic samples, because this is uh, most of the time, the application that we are handling when we are using fusion for something. In this case, we are having a sample. The sample is oxidic or fully oxidized. We are having 
a lithium borate. The lithium borate in this case is our fusion flux and the glass builder that will um, make the glass in the end. Then those two parts are homogenized. And in the end, you will obtain a mixture for fusion. Um, this mixture of the sample of the, uh, and the lithium borate then goes into a crucible. Then in whatever way you decided on uh, is fused manually, electric or, or by in, in a gas fusion machine. And um, then you get your fused bead. And now we could say that sounds really easy. And it is for oxidic samples. But in our case, we are talking about ferroalloys. And this means we are dealing with metallic parts. If we are trying to fuse something with a metallic, um, metallic parts uh, in this way, then we will damage our crucibles up until the point that they are completely destroyed. Why is this the case? This has to do with chemical and mechanical re resistance of the crucibles that we are using for um, fusion processes. Um, the crucibles and the molds we are using, they look like this, and they are made um, from um, a platinum gold alloy, which is 95% platinum and 5% of gold. And we are using this um, this alloy for, for the platinum cru crucibles and molds because um, this alloy is chemically and mechanically very resistant. We are talking about a melting point of 1,675 degrees Celsius to 1,745 1, degrees Celsius. So very, very high melting point here. And especially when we are looking at the temperature which we are using for fusion, which is in our devices, mostly something between 1,200 degrees Celsius and 1,250 degrees Celsius. Now, what's happening when we are taking metallic parts? Metallic parts, they can act as so-called platinum poisons. Um, why, why are they called this? Because they are destroying the uh, platinum. How do they do it? Um, the melting point, um, which is one of the main reasons we are using this alloy for, um, for our um, platinum ware, um, is lowered when the platinum is alloying with other metals. And then we get this, um, yeah, this, these damaged crucibles. We get the shock whenever the machine opens and, um, and, and, and one of these uh, the crucibles looking like this get out of the, get out of the furnace. And you, um, you realize that some metallic parts were in your sample and that, and that the fusion didn't work as planned. Um, obviously, this is not what we want because these crucibles cannot be reused. Um, these crucibles do have to be recycled. Um, and now we could say, okay, then we can stop because we don't have oxidized samples here. So fusion is not a possibility. Um, but that's not the case because if you're doing it correctly, um, you will prevent your um, your crucibles to look like, from looking like this. And I can show you now that there are two methods um, how to prevent crucibles um, from, from looking like this after the fusion. Um, first of all, what did, we say, what did we say before? We need an oxidic sample. And how can we get our sample to become, um, become an oxidic sample when we are right now having a metal, metal alloy? Um, we are using um, some kind of oxidizer. And there are two methods how to do it. The first one is explained here. You have your sample and you take your oxidizer, you mix it together, put it in a crucible, and then um, oxidize the whole thing um, at between 600 and 800 degrees Celsius. Um, at this temperature, um, nothing happens to your crucible 
because it's not yet the temperature um, that is making uh, the metal parts of the sample along with the platinum. So at this temperature, you are very safe to oxidize your sample. Then you have your oxidized sample like on the bottom of your crucible. And to this oxidized sample, um, the, now the lithium borate, the flux is the fusion flux is added. And now after you oxidized your sample, um, you are performing the fusion and the homogenization. And then you have a, your homogeneous mixture. Um, that one then can be poured into the mold. So the mold is safe too, because there's homogeneous uh, mixture of um, borate and oxidized sample. And then you can obtain a fused bead and a crucible that's not damaged. This is the first way how you can do it. What is the risk? You are mi mixing the sample directly with the oxidizer and depending on how harsh this reaction is going to be at 600 to 800 degrees, it might be the case that, um, that the sample uh, spills over the rim of the crucible and um, is somewhere inside your furnace. Um, you can um, prevent uh, this from happening by, for example, adding a small part of lithium borate just to slow down the reaction. But you still have to make sure that the reaction is finished so that you are having like your oxidized sample here. So um, this method um, needs to be treated carefully and you need to um, do some, some, some research on this if that's possible for your sample before doing it. The second method um, is, is something like an all-in-one method. So here in this case, you're mixing the sample and the oxidizer. Um, and you are also already taking the lithium borate. You're taking the lithium borate on the bottom of your crucible, and then you're topping it with the oxidizer and the sample mixture so th that uh, the oxidizer and the sample are um, on top of your lithium borate and they are not touching crucible walls. And then you can perform the oxidation at 600 to 800 degrees as before, but you are already having the lithium borate inside uh, your crucible and it's somehow surrounding this, um, this process of oxidation. And then you're already having your complete mixture with the with the uh, fusion flux inside your um, your crucible here then you can do fusion and homogenization and pouring and you get the fused bead it's a matter of your material and your um, your method that you're using um, to to decide on which preparation is suitable for this but these are the two possibilities that are there what does a uh, oxidative fusion look like? You can see, as I said before, there's a lower temperature for the oxidation that is way below the melting point of the borate and the sample. Um, so here you're just having sample and oxidizing agent reacting to um, get your sample oxidized. Then you higher the fusion temperature and in this, um, in this part of the fusion, then the solid to liquid uh, transformation is happening and the homogenization of the whole thing. Then it's poured and cold, and then you are obtaining the fused bead um, that did not destroy your crucibles. So there are some... Um, yeah, some, some oxidizing agents um, in the market that can be used. Um, this, is, um, this is a list where it's already uh, kind of narrowed down to a few um, oxidizing agents. There are way more in the market. Um, and just um, let, let's just concentrate on, um, on the ones that are um, really important for us today. Um, there's like as one example of oxidizing agents that you can use for um, a lot of ferro alloys would then be a strontium nitrate. Um, this oxidizing agent is very easy to use. And normally we are not looking for strontium in the ferro alloys. Um, so the strontium will not do any harm. And the whole thing will um, also double as a um, heavy absorber. Um, so this is also an advantage of using this um, oxidizing agent. 
Um, if you need a stronger oxidizing agent, then you will end up at some point using vanadium pentoxide. Um, this is the strongest um, um, oxidizing agent that's available. You can see that it's, for example, used for ferrosilicon. And um, yeah, the, the problem here is that it's very toxic. You can see from all of these symbols below um, that the toxicity of this, um, um, this uh, oxidizing agent is um, yeah, very, very bad. And um, yeah, you have to think about if not another oxidizing agent will be enough. Also, you will have the uh, vanadium inside and it can interfere with, uh, with um, other parts of your sample. So um, also be careful about this. How do these oxidizing agents uh, work in, in general? In general, they are used to, um, um, to oxidize the, um, the parts of your ferroalloy. Um, in this uh, case, um, the ferrosilicon is then oxidized uh, to um, iron oxide and uh, silicon oxide. Um, and this is done, as I said before, using, uh, for example, van vanadium pentoxide here. Um, we also already talked about the strontium nitrate. There are also some more nitrates that can be used that are basically doing the same job. Um, there you just have to decide like which one's suitable for your sample. And be careful because for these um, reactions, there's nitrous gases escaping from this reaction. Um, so this uh, should definitely take place um, under a fume hood and um, be supervised uh, in, in a good way. Um, in general, you can use different oxidizing agents and you have to think about how strong does the oxidizing agent, um, um, uh, how strong do I need it to be? And um, if there could be unwanted effects, for example, some line overlaps, or I shouldn't use vanadium pentoxide when I'm um, trying to uh, measure ferrovanadium. So like, these are the things we have to have a look at. Um, now we talked a lot about what's possible in fusion, and now I want to have a small um, um, excourse on what's not possible in fusion. And when we are talking about um, ferroalloys, we are also talking about phosphorus traces and sulfur content. And these two things cannot be analyzed reliable in a fused bead. Why is this the case? We are having a very high dilution in fused beads and um, the phosphorus concentrations are then so low that they fall below our limit of detection for this preparation. And for the sulfur, the sulfur is partly present as sulfides and sulfides are randomly volatile in fusion. So you cannot correct for it because it's just random how much uh, sulfide is ex escaping or not. Um, so phosphorus traces sulfur content, not possible in fusion, but um, a preparation as pressed pellet is an option for these two. And I will show an example for this later. Um, also, there are some things that cannot be oxidized completely. Um, passivated um, aluminum oxide is one of these cases where this cannot be done completely. So what can we still do in, um, in fusion to make our uh, results even better? Uh, sometimes it makes sense to use an internal standard. In this case, uh, we are using tungsten um, oxide as an, as an internal standard um, to, um, um, to correct, um, in this case, for, for the form of the, um, of the, um, of the mold. Uh, what is happening with the mold when it is stressed a lot um, and metallic um, oxidative fusions are stressing platinum wear, even though they are not destroying it, um, the mold starts hanging. And if you want to have reliable um, um, results, you would have to exchange them quite a lot and often. 
Um, so whenever they are starting hanging, you, you would have to um, recycle them directly. So the use of an internal standard gives us the possibility to, um, to use our molds a little bit longer. Still, when they are hanging very bad, you should definitely recycle them to uh, still get, um, get reliable results. Um, how, is, how does an internal standard work? Um, you um, divide every, um, every um, compartment that you are, um, you, you, are want, you, you, you are correcting for with the um, internal standard, you're dividing their intensity by the intensity of the internal standard. And then you still have to pay attention because there's, um, there's an, another line introduced here, another, um, another um, element introduced, and this element can enhance or absorb other elements that we want to have a look at. So there will be some corrections necessary. So how are we using internal standards in general? When we are using internal standards, all parameters of the measurement have to be the same. So if we are, for example, correcting uh, iron or, or zinc or um, whatever um, element, um, the one, the element we are correcting um, has to be measured in the very same way we are measuring the tungsten, otherwise it doesn't work. We are using gross lines in this case and there's no drift correction necessary. So this has a lot of advantages. There's one disadvantage that you have to pay attention for. Um, when you are changing the chemical that you're using as internal standards, you have to test the new batch because the new batch has to show the exact uh, very same effect. And if it does not, um, you have to adjust the weight until your results will show the, um, the same effect as for the other batch. And this can be kind of complicated. So be careful with this. So, and now we can have a look into the practical part for the, for the next few minutes. Um, Fluxana is offering um, plenty um, sets for, um, for ferro um, analysis. And I just want, would like to show you some, some reality to this, um, to this um, topic. Um, these sets are mostly um, made of fused beads. And this is what it can look like. So in this case, we are looking at a ferrosilicon um, application. Um, and um, in this case, um, we are looking at the calibration table for, for this uh, ferrosilicon application. We are having 19 calibration standards. We are having 10 synthetic standards and four validation samples. They are down here. So this is what a calibration set for ferrosilicon could look like. Um, why are we using synthetic standards and what are the synthetic standards anyway? Um, we are often having the problem that there are only a very few top quality CRMs available in the range that we need them. And we need some of them as validation samples because you always need validation samples that are apart from your calibration. So they cannot be used in the calibration. But then we have two little CRMs available for the calibration. So what are we doing? We are weighing pure chemicals to reach specific concentrations. And this gives us a high flexibility in choosing the CRMs, choosing the um, validation CRMs, and then designing our calibrations around it. And also when a CRM, for example, is sold out, we can also replace it by, by doing uh, it synthetically. And this gives us a lot of flexibility in the design of these kinds of sets. Mm, how, does the, um, how does the preparation look like for this? Um, in this case, we are using an internal standard, which is uh, tungsten oxide. We are having a fusion flux and the, um, and the internal standard. We are having vanadium pentoxide as oxidizer plus the sample. First of all, the crucible is filled with the internal standard and the flux. Everything is mixed and a hollow is formed. 
And as you can see, this is method two all in one. Um, the sample and the oxidizer are mixed thoroughly and they go into this hollow and then the crucible walls must not be touched and then we can fuse the whole thing. And then if we are looking at silicon, for example, we will get a calibration curve that looks somehow like this. This is like a real calibration curve um, of a silicon, a ferrosilicon um, application that we are using here in our laboratory. Um, the silicon calibration is um, in the range of 15 to 100%. And as you can see, um, the SEE, so the deviation of the curve um, is uh, 0.3 two, something like this, point, point 0.32, and the correlation is 0 0.9998. And um, um, yeah, this is how good it can get, how, how good or how bad it can get with, with fusion. But um, you can definitely work with this kind of, um, of calibration to get reliable, um, reliable results. Um, then you would also have something like a control chart. This is our control chart. You can see it's like um, I, I, I chose a uh, 2019 to recently um, 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 part of the control chart. And you can see that this method is very reliable um, for the analysis of, in this case, silicon. So this would then be fusion. But I also said that sometimes it's, um, it's not possible to use fusion, in, especially when it comes to, to phosphorus traces. So um, I would like to show you an example for the analysis of phosphorus uh, traces. Um, in this case, we did it with uh, uh, phosphorus traces in ferrochromium um, in pressed pellets. Um, first of all, you need samples with known phosphorus concentrations. This can be CRMs, this can be round robin samples or own samples with reliable analyzers. Um, you have to prepare them as pressed pellets um, with a reliable sample preparation, reproducible sample preparation, and then calibrate the whole thing. How can um, the preparation look like? You have your sample. In this case, we mixed it with uh, Cereox, which is our wax. Um, we mixed it um, using this uh, small uh, muck mixer, and then we pressed it um, in, an, in an automated uh, press. And then we obtained a stable pressed pellet. And with these stable pressed pellets, we then calibrated for phosphorus. And you see, now we are talking about traces. So our calibration line is not as good looking as the um, as the silicon, but still we are we are we are looking at traces, and we are able to um, to see like which which concentration is there, and we are talking about a calibration range from uh, 0 0.006 um, to 0 0.022, and um, yeah, this is the the correlation that we obtained for this phosphorus uh, calibration. It worked quite well um, for, for the phosphorus traces. And um, you can still enhance the, uh, the, the calibration for sure if you are having, for example, some more standards um, and, and um, for, for some corrections that might be needed for these kinds of um, calibrations. And now last but not least, what can I do if I need to measure several ferroalloys? The problem is for some, uh, some laboratories that they need to um, measure more than one ferroalloy. Uh, so we decided to develop a ferroalloy set for all of these nine ferroalloys that I showed before um, in, in this very first chart where they were marked in yellow. Um, here, the aim is just analyzing main components and a few minor components, and we want to have the least preparatory effort as possible. The arrow is allowed to be higher um, than in a more specific calibration, and we did it to, um, um, to get three methods with three recipes, and we are covering all the ferroalloys, ferrosilicon, ferromolybdenum, ferroniob, ferrotungsten, 
ferromanganese, silicomanganese, ferrotitanium, ferrovanadium, and ferrochromium. So quite a lot of ferroalloys. How does that work? We are having um, 32 standards for these six um, ferroalloys, 12 standards for these two ferroalloys, and six standards for ferrochrome. Um, these, um, these six or two or ferrochrome are each one recipe and one calibration. So in total, we are having 50 standards with which we can do this um, calibration for all of these um, ferroalloys. Um, why do we do this? Um, if we are pooling these kinds of um, ferroalloys, we need less standards for the individual alloy um, to create the calibration curves in a very nice way. And um, that means with 50 standards, uh, we are done for all of these alloys. And then we also uh, changed and, and, and tested a little bit on the recipes to make them then applicable to more ferroalloys in a more universal way so that we can have a lot of ferroalloys with this preparation, some with this, and then ferrochrome is left. But still, it's three preparations and three recipes instead of nine. OK, so let's sum this up very quickly because we are already ahead of time. Um, there are many different ferroalloys, and different alloys demand different sample preparation and calibration. The first thing we talked about is that there are some metallic parts um, um, in the ferroalloys that um, are um, acting as uh, platinum poisons. Um, that means, depending on your material, you need um, oxidizers, different oxidizers, different amounts, depending on your material. And um, you also need a fusion program that is fit for purpose. Then we saw that um, due to the high dilution infusion, it is uh, very hard to uh, measure traces. And sometimes it's even impossible, for example, for phosphorus traces. Um, then there's still the option to calibrate with pressed pellets. And then we also talked about using internal standards. Why do we do this? Molds are specially stressed by these uh, kinds of materials containing uh, metal parts. And then we are using internal standards to correct for this error here. And last but not least, we are, um, have, might have some problem being um, in the position that we need to measure several different um, alloys. Um, in this case, it makes sense to find an effective solution to this um, by pooling materials um, with uh, similar fusion characteristics and components of interest. And then you can use uh, universal recipes and by having a clever compilation of standards, put it all together into, into yeah, in this case, three, three calibrations. And this set, is, is one of the sets that are um, directly available. So if you need, um, need help with this kind of set, um, just let us know. So, and now we are already a little late, but still I want to uh, say thank you for your attention. And I want to um, uh, say that um, next uh, month there will be a very interesting webinar um, on um, error propagation and its impact uh, on the results of XRF. And since I said the word error quite a lot today, <laughs> if, you are, um, if you're interested in this, you should not miss this um, very interesting topic there. So um, we are already quite late. I would say um, thank you and all your questions that you um, asked in the meantime uh, will be answered via email within the next days. And yeah, I wish you a very nice rest of the day.